Welcome to the Vermont House Government Operations Committee meeting. Uh, this morning we will be meeting with some uh, municipal and school board folks in order to understand uh, some of the challenges that they may be experiencing due to the switch from in-person meetings and in-person contact uh, to, uh, to more remote settings in order to keep socially distant. So I'm going to go ahead and run right through the list of folks um, in the order that I have them. So that would be Carol Dawes first and then Gwyn Zakoff, and then we can um, go through from the school board's perspective. So we have uh, Sue. Uh, Sue, you have to unmute yourself and tell me how to say your last name. Good morning, it's Sue Seglowski. Seglowski, okay, thank you so much. <laughs> so Sue Siglowski <clears throat> can uh, can share some thoughts with us. We have Martha Heath and we also have uh, Tim Smith. So thank you all for being with us um, this morning. We appreciate you being here to uh, share your perspective and your and the challenges that you're facing so that we can hopefully find ways to uh, help you continue to do your important work um, while we remain socially distant. Um, so Carol Dawes, I'm going to have you go ahead and, and speak first, and then um, committee members, if you want to raise your hand to ask a, a question of Carol, um, please do that, and I'll let her get through, um, you know, kind of her her thoughts and, and um, perspective first, and then we'll go to questions, but you can go ahead and get yourself in the queue um, if you'd like to ask her a question, and then after we've uh, asked Carol questions, we will go on to uh, to hear if Gwyn has anything to add to that. Uh, we'll do the same with her. Uh, so go ahead, Carol. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Carol Dawes, uh, Legislative Chair of Vermont Municipal Clerk and Treasurer's Association. Um, and, uh, and I like the mud season picture. <laughs> <laughs> it seems more appropriate than the beach. <laughs> Um, I did want to just share with you a, a number of different uh, topics that um, are sort of working their way through out in clerk and treasurer land. Um, one of the ones that uh, is most uh, relevant, I'm sure, to this committee has to do with land records. Uh, you'll recall we spent a lot of time last year um, working together on uh, some increases associated with the recording of land records and, and other bits and pieces. And what came out of that was a, a consortium of uh, stakeholders um, that has continued to work together. Well, starting two, three weeks ago, um, before the, the stay home order, um, clerk's offices were starting to close, uh, close to the public, offer um, limited access to their land records. And there were concerns voiced by um, the, the Bar Association, the Attorney Title Corporation, the Bankers Association, um, who uh, have been attempting to maintain business as usual. Um, and they reached out to me about, could we find a way to uh, at least have a database of um, what sort of hours or restrictions clerk's offices were uh, working under at that point in time. And um, we roped in the Secretary of State's office because they have a master email list. Uh, we created a, a survey which was sent out um, and the majority of uh, towns um, responded uh, and a, a spreadsheet was created and housed on the Secretary of State's website. They've been very good about keeping it updated uh, as new data has come through. So I, as always, I wanna thank all those different stakeholders who uh, participated in, in providing this uh, service for, for all of us. Um, with the issuance of the governor's order, um, I do believe that all clerk's offices are now closed to the public. Um, most of the offices have also closed their vaults uh, and uh, are working to find alternative ways to provide research opportunities for um, for uh, people who are working on land records or, or closings, uh, refinancings. Um, 
one of the things that clerks are are sort of taught right from day one is to be cautious about doing research services in uh, our vaults for other people, that there might be liability issues if we were to provide incorrect information or incomplete information. And so uh, in the past, we have not provided those services. Our vaults were open for people to come in and do it. But under the current circumstances, uh, I think a lot of clerks have eased those uh, restrictions. Uh, I know that uh, researchers are now emailing me lists of documents, um, which I'm able to uh, scan and email to them, uh, along with an invoice. And they, uh, because a lot of our documents are online, they can access documents themselves, or they can at least look at the index and then send me a list that says, please send me book 312, page 14. Um, and we're able to do that. Uh, we're all very careful about putting a disclaimer uh, in our responses, letting them know that, you know, we bear no responsibility or liability associated with any missing or incomplete or, or incorrect um, information. But, but I think that it's just one example, uh, and I'll give others, of ways that clerks are uh, looking for creative workarounds, um, ways to continue as much uh, business as usual as possible. Um, documents, of course, continue to be received for recording. Um, and depending on uh, how closed down a clerk's office is, um, they are at the minimum making sure to receive mail on a regular basis and date and time stamp um, the documents so as to uh, maintain a, a clear timeline for, uh, for title purposes. So, and you'll recall that one of the things that we worked on last year in the, the fee bill was language about making sure that documents were date and time stamped at a minimum. So um, that, that is certainly moving forward. Any questions on land records? Okay. Uh, dog licenses, um, as you probably know, the state statute requires that all dogs in the state of Vermont be licensed by April 1st. Um, and towns don't have the authority to, uh, to extend or didn't before the governor signed um, the 681, didn't have the authority to extend the deadline for dog licenses. But I do believe that most towns did um, allow uh, licenses to be issued after the 1st of April with no late penalty. The late penalty is kept by the municipality. It's not state revenues. So um, uh, towns and clerks certainly felt comfortable offering that extension to our, our citizens. Um, with vital records, um, we're doing, uh, when we're receiving requests for uh, birth certificates, death certificates, marriage license certified copies, um, we're doing all of that by mail um, or by email. Uh, and that seems to be working well. There don't seem to be any um, hiccups with that. Um, liquor licenses, uh, liquor licenses in the state of Vermont all expire the end of uh, this month, the end of April. Uh, Department of Liquor and Lottery uh, is, um, they have in their statutes the authority to um, create a, a, a category that allows them to um, consider a, a license um, still in effect after the, uh, the date has passed, as long as the application has been submitted. So they, uh, they are continuing to allow people to and submit Andrea, hard copies, me. obviously, but they've also created- So I think um, what's happening is I think you're looking under the wrong more menu. I'm sorry. It, okay, good you morning, you Tony, you are unmuted. Are you, are you trying to get a message so to look us? Under the more button at the bottom of that menu. I am going to go ahead and mute him. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Carol. Yep. Yeah. So, Department of Liquor and Lottery has also put uh, an online application process uh, in place where um, people can uh, 
license holders can log into their website and um, file the required information without needing to file the fees immediately uh, because that application will have been quote unquote received uh, they will continue to be um, licensed after the uh, the end of this month um, and once uh, the emergency is lifted uh, they will go back to the sort of normal process and they'll reach out to license holders to collect the fees the municipal portion of the fees will be remitted to us. Um, and that seems to, I mean, the notice just went out yesterday about that. Um, and I haven't heard any uh, negative comments or feedback yet from either license holders or fellow clerks. So I think that uh, that's going to be a, a great way to move forward uh, with that particular um, deadline. Um, Great. Hold on just a second. John yeah. Gannon has his hand up. Okay. Go ahead, John. Unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Carol. I had a question about land records. Yeah. Um, you said there's liability issues. Is there anything we can do to help clerks with those liability issues? I Not that I'm aware of, and that might be a better question for Gwen when we get to her. Um, and, and I'm not even sure that how much liability there might be. It's just something we've, we've always been concerned about, um, you know, not wanting to have any potential liability come down on clerks or, or the towns and in some way endanger a, a title on a property. So yeah. uh, does there need to be education of clerks on this? I mean, are, are clerks not helping because they assume there's some liability there there may be some of that going on we certainly have um have tried to put stuff out on the list sir but gwen may have uh, an answer gwen go ahead and introduce yourself um uh gwen zach of um from the vermont league of cities and towns a municipal policy advocate um Really, it boils down to a job description. So under a town clerk's job description, um, the, you know, what they can do is clearly defined. So doing anything beyond that creates sort of the liability, but how much exposure that is, is really, you know, it's who knows. Okay, thank you. One of the other things that, that has changed uh, under the current situation is uh, notarial services, notarial services. Um, most, if not all, city clerks are notaries uh, and traditionally offer services um, because that notaries, uh, uh, that's one of the things that requires face-to-face, in-person uh, interactions. Um, clerks have been working to be creative in their ways uh, to provide uh, such services. Um, people have been meeting out in parking lots or passing papers through the front door of their town hall. Um, to and We're asking people to bring their own clipboards and pens um, to try to uh, minimize uh, any possibilities for contact. Um, my guess is that there's probably uh, less notarization going on um, because I do know that that clerks are concerned about the possibility of of being handed a, a, a document or handing documents or back and forth. Um, but uh, but to my knowledge, there hasn't been um, a, a considerable uh, downturn in the amount of notarizations that. Are being provided uh, we certainly see that there are a lot less being requested um, and I'm sure that that's just that the kind of work that requires uh, notarization of documents um, is uh, is suppressed at the time being. Um, there was uh, recently uh, the, the legislature passed the uh, remote notarization um, emergency uh, legislation uh, However, that doesn't affect clerks as a general rule because there are very strict guidelines and requirements uh, for technology. You have to record the people participating in the remote notarization. And that's not something that, that most clerks uh, are prepared to do. So 
Um, I think it's primarily for uh, conducting uh, legal and real estate uh, transactions. Marriage licenses are another, we've seen an uptick in marriage licenses. I'm not sure whether it's the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, and the fact that we're moving into the, uh, the marriage season, as it were. Um, marriages is another one of those uh, interactions that requires face-to-face -face because statute says that clerks must witness at least one of the parties signing the document uh, at the time that it is issued. Um, and so we're able to do everything else electronically. They can download the application and fill it out electronically, uh, email it to us, we can create the license. But then at that point, we do have to actually meet with them. Um, we've had people come to the front door, again, similar to notarization, people are meeting out in parking lots or at their front door and passing documents through and uh, requiring they bring their own clipboards and pens. Um, but that seems to be uh, moving forward. I, I haven't heard of any clerks denying issuance of a marriage license. Um, we're all just looking for creative ways to get around that. Um, one of the things that I didn't include on the, the written testimony that I submitted uh, has to do with elections. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, H681, which the governor signed earlier this, uh, this week, um, had some uh, emergency language in there around elections, uh, elect, uh, both local and uh, state elections. Um, and uh, there are a lot of clerks right now who are dealing with local elections, whether it's budget revotes or um, reconsiderations of other articles uh, that were uh, voted at town meeting, or uh, as an example, Barry Town, which holds their town meeting election traditionally the second Tuesday of um, uh, May. Uh, you know, so they're deep in preparation for uh, for their annual meeting. Um, Barry Town has postponed to the first Tuesday in June. Um, and because of the uh, the language uh, in 681, um, which gives the Secretary of State's office in conjunction with the administration, the authority to um, work with communities to find solutions. Uh, we had a wonderful um, email out from Will Senning from the Secretary of State's Office Election Division uh, yesterday or the day before with a lot of great information about, you know, how to make adjustments on the local level. Um, and and I, I know clerks found that very helpful. Um, we're likely to see additional changes as we move into the season for the August primary and perhaps even the November general election. A lot of people um, don't, they think the August primary sounds like it's a long ways away, but actually the deadlines, as all of you know, for nominating petitions are not that far away. They're coming up next month. Um, and then immediately after that, the ballots have to be printed. And if the intention is to go to uh, all mail votes, that has an impact on how many ballots are printed. And so there's a lot of moving parts that are coming up in the not too distant future. Um, and there will likely need to be changes. Um, and clerks are being kept informed about that through the Secretary of State's office. The last thing I wanna mention is um, the, that uh, there's been a lot of discussion uh, by your fellow committees um, around lodging the grand list and tax bills. Um, there was uh, yesterday Senate Finance um, took testimony, the day before House Ways and Means took testimony uh, and uh, talking about um, extensions of the impact of the extension of the filing deadline for income taxes and uh, homestead declarations, property tax adjustment claim forms, um, and that impact on lodging grand lists, on issuing uh, property tax bills. Um, it looks like what will likely happen is that, uh, particularly for communities like Barry City, where we issue our tax bills traditionally the middle of July with our first payment due the middle of August, we may be a month 
later than usual. Um, that does, of course, have uh, potential cash flow issues, and and uh, um, municipalities are concerned about that, and and um, looking at, at ways uh, to address that. Um, but one of the things that I really appreciate is that um, everybody from from the legislature to the to property valuation and review uh, and the Department of Taxes and the Secretary of State's office and the administration, everybody is looking for different uh, tools that they can provide. Um, and the more tools we have, uh, the more options the different municipalities will have in figuring out what time frames will work best for them, what procedures will work best. Um, and you know, while while none of it is is perfect or optimal, it, it certainly um, will help us get through what is um, you know trying times. So any questions from anybody? Uh, John Gannon, go right ahead. Um, Carol, um, with, with, with respect to the grand list, I mean, there, there's going to start to be people appealing their property valuations, um, which means the Board of Civil Authority will have to meet um, to re after there's lister grievances. Um, part of the, the BCA process is actually doing home inspections, um, which doesn't seem very appropriate in this environment. Um, do, do you think we need to do anything to assist with, with that appeal process? I think that, first of all, if we back up a step and look at the grievance process, um, because that too requires face-to-face -face public meetings, um, and the Property Valuation and Review has put out some really wonderful um, tips on how to do grievance hearings virtually um, or other different ways to do it. Um, uh, obviously, listers and assessors who are currently working on updates to the grand list, they can't do interior inspections uh, or, or look at con construction. Um, so uh, PVR has also put out um, uh, tips about ways to gather information um, from property owners. Uh, also, VALA, the Vermont Association of Listers and Assessors, has put out some guidance about ways to do that. So I think that that step of grievance hearings, there are options out there. Um, with regards to the appeals to the Board of Civil Authority, um, one of the things that would be helpful would be confirmation as to whether the open meeting law changes um, also would apply to uh, what are considered um, quasi-judicial hearings. Um, development review boards, uh, board of abatement, board of civil authority, um, and if in fact the the, the new changes um, do apply to that, then then we would uh, need to just educate the the public and the the boards of civil authority um, as to what that would mean, um, how to hold your meetings virtually, um, and conduct um, your. Uh, your, your taking of testimony, your hearings that way. Um, obviously, at least under the current um, situation, uh, we're not going to be able to make internal uh, inspections um, of the property. Uh, and then, so I would hope that uh, the guidance that's being given by uh, VALA and PVR could be modified for um, BCA hearings and inspections also. Well, I think the statute actually requires inspections of homes. Yeah. And so that concerns me because it specifically says if you don't follow the process, right. then, then the town loses the grievance. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there may need to be a legislative fix there, um, at least a temporary one. Do you think, do you agree or? No, I, I, I it certainly, it certainly, it certainly needs view. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Jim Harrison. Yeah, good morning, Carol. On a, a separate issue, thank you for getting back to me on the uh, my inquiry on the Barry City Charter proposed yep. changes. But um, on these issues, you mentioned um, marriage licenses. Uh, do you need a statutory change to get at that issue um, that we're facing now with um, 
uh, you know, in-person uh, signing. And then somewhat related, the whole um, topic of vital records. Uh, um, what happens now uh, with death certificates um, and other things or getting that information uh, back from the town? Um, with regards to marriage licenses, I, I guess that we could we could look at a temporary um, easing of the uh, requirement to have a document signed in front of us. Um, I, as I said, I haven't heard of anybody uh, denying a marriage license or, or not being able to figure out how to make it work. Um, but we are moving into the marriage season. Not sure whether we'll see um, a, a bit of a, a downturn in the number of marriages considering people can't have weddings, you know, wedding parties. Um, but, uh, but it might be something worth looking at um, as a possible um, emergency situation that, that we could um, mail the unsigned license out to people with instructions that they, um, you know, that bar both parties have to sign. And, uh, and of course, they also have to have their uh, officiant sign. Um, so, um, with regards to vital records, uh, since the system is predominantly uh, electronic now, um, with clerks receiving uh, birth and uh, death certificates from the Department of Health, um, or notice of them in the, the new statewide system, um, we're not handling uh, documents and because we now require the application process anyway for certified copies, um, that is uh, relatively easily done uh, through the mail or through email and online payments. Um, haven't seen that as any kind of a problem at this stage of the game. Okay, thank you. All right, Hal Colston has a question. Uh, hi, Carol. Hey. Um, Hi. So could an electronic signature suffice the application process for, for marriage license? Uh, that I don't know because I don't know what, uh, what? what restrictions there might be. I, I know that electronic signatures are acceptable for a number of Vermont documents. Um, and I don't know whether it would be just a question of uh, expanding that to include marriage licenses, um, but but I would think that it's something that that could be done. I think part of the reason that the the law exists the way it is right now is the the city or the marriage licenses don't have any other ID requirement. Um, when the person signs the license, when they sign the application and then sign the license, they are signing. Uh, attesting to the veracity of the information on the application and on the license under the pains and penalties of perjury. Um, and so I think that that having that signature witnessed um, by the clerk uh, is there to um, provide a, a layer of, um, of attestation. Um, and I'm not sure if, if having all of it done remotely would satisfy that. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Unmute yourself. In the last 15 seconds of my time here. Carol, <laughs> as somebody who does weddings every now and then, particularly here in Burlington with a lot of immigrant, um, I, I just got a really sort of strange reaction to nobody actually seeing people who are signing for these things. I did a wedding last year, almost did a wedding last year, where the bride had just come into the country, could not speak English. The, the groom's parents were interpreting for her, and it was just really uncomfortable that she was even knowing what was going on. Uh, throwing up a flag and saying goodbye for a while. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I personally, I, I have a similar reaction. We've had some issues here in Barry City 
um, where uh, there was a woman who was performing marriages for inmates um, and mm -hmm. it turned out that uh, she was uh, working with uh, quote unquote brides um, who actually were forging documents um, and there, there, there weren't actually weddings occurring. Uh, I don't know what the what the reasoning behind any of that would be, but um, but we, you know, I reached out to the attorney general's office and and reported a, a number of of these weddings, um, but but yes, having the having one of the two parties sign in front of us, uh, I think is um, is helpful. Any other questions for Carol? All right. Thank you, Carol, for, for doing such a good job of collecting uh, many different perspectives on how things are working. Thank you. Appreciate you. Uh, so Gwyn, let's go ahead and, and have you take it away for a few moments. Hello, everybody. Gwyn Zakov, uh, for the record, Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, I believe I haven't been able to check your uh, committee website, but I believe you should have um, my testimony in front of you. Let me know if you don't. Yes, you do. Okay. Um, so um, I won't read it. Uh, I'll go through some of the highlights and some additional information um, at the end. If there's any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so from a 40,000 uh, over the last three weeks or so, um, about cities and towns across Vermont, um, are things like uh, just adjusting to the new world that everybody is living in, trying to work from home, um, trying to uh, raise children, to um, live our lives, um, and uh, in hey, terms of uh, yeah. Can, can you hold on just a second? Folks, are you having trouble hearing Gwen? She's kind of breaking up. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing it's on your end. And I wonder if you try shutting off video, if maybe we can just catch your audio while you're doing your presentation. Sure. Let's try that for a moment. And if it doesn't get clearer, maybe we'll have you call again. So go ahead and say a few sentences here and we'll see if we can hear you. Video. Well, your video has gone, but your audio is not getting much better. Okay. Would it be helpful for me calling? Let's, well, we could certainly try that, um, but the meeting may be locked at the moment. So let me just, okay. uh, I'm going to ask IT. All right, why don't you go ahead and continue for a moment and um, we'll see if that is, see if it is cleared up. Okay, stop me again. <laughs> if it's not working, I apologize. Um, we're seeing increased um, absenteeism. Um, some of our offices of that absenteeism was created on purpose, obviously, since we have stay at home orders. Some of the absenteeism is created on purpose to ensure that um, folks that are working, let's say in wastewater treatment plants or working um, on town road crews are um, keeping adequate social distancing from each other. So you're, you're seeing towns um, putting uh, folks on different shifts in order to space um, individuals. And um, you're seeing increases of uh, towns and cities using mutual aid for things that they generally haven't used mutual aid for. Mutual aid is usually used for public safety purposes. But now we're seeing uh, it being used more widely for things um, in, in cases needed for things uh, like essential services, um, such as, again, wastewater treatment plant operations. Um, just in case um, folks go down, they're making sort of um, side agreements to make sure um, they have adequate people to staff um, in case things um, get worse. 
Um, we are dealing with telecom broadband issues uh, like everybody is dealing with. Um, and it it's uh, everyone singing the same tune, I guess. So we have uh, folks working from home. Um, some individuals don't have good internet or any internet. We have individual, we have towns that are really trying to keep people on payroll um, and trying to keep people in uh, doing their jobs, but um, not, you know, in, not every town has uh, it, their employees with individual laptops or um, computers or IT setups that are, um, that are workable under these circumstances. So they're um, dealing with those sorts of issues. And when you're dealing with that, you have towns that are um, obviously closed to the public at this point, <laughs> but are allowing um, sort of uh, certain town employees or city employees to come into the office um, if it's uh, if they're able to keep adequate um, social distancing. Um, the open meeting law issues, we're thankful for those changes that you put into place. And um, that being said, we're having um, the same sort of IT and tele and video conferencing issues everybody else is having. Um, a lot of towns are not really familiar with this technology, so they're trying to get up to speed and trying to implement um, these uh, these tools um, for particularly now we're seeing for you know select board meetings and city council meetings, but increasingly it could be for um, other types of meetings. But I think a lot of towns have really pumped the brakes on, um, uh, like for example, you know DRB meetings or um, planning commission meetings or you know certainly smaller um, commissions or boards that don't um, meet as frequent frequently. Um, the um, yeah, so I think that we, we've had some surveys go out um, over the past few weeks. Everyone is very, very obviously busy. So um, we have uh, a decent amount of data, but not uh, a ton of it. We um, are getting some surveys back, hopefully by today. A bunch of questions about you know what are the biggest problems your town officials are facing. Um, just to sort of get a, an idea where their needs are, but that's a sort of merit. Um, so going back to the issue of finance, um, so uh, uh, Carol Dodds had brought this up and um, Representative Gannon as well. So towns um, are anticipating fewer tax revenues due to uh, late payments or delinquencies and um, perhaps more requests for abatement um, and deferral of payment deadlines. Um, we're also, uh, in the survey we sent out earlier, we are asking about liquidity and borrowing needs for towns because of those sorts of issues. Um, we're also asking towns, um, and they're relatively familiar with doing things when it comes to sort of FEMA reimbursement, but basically tracking all COVID-19 related costs moving forward, although sometimes those are sort of hard to splice, you know, what is COVID and what isn't COVID. Sometimes it's um, hard to, to, uh, to die. Um, we are also dealing with town meetings having had just happened right before <laughs> this, this whole situation going down. And um, A, you have a lot of new select board members that were elected, have never been in town office, and all of a sudden they're forced with dealing with this issue. We haven't even had a chance to do our select board sort of boot camp that we have. Um, we are have moved it our training to uh, webinar based um, and Hopefully that will help, but they're, um, uh, those, I feel sorry for those new city councilors and select board members. Um, it's uh, a strange time to onboard to a board. Um, they, with budgets being passed and sort of the, um, the things that were approved at town meeting, they obviously towns have their marching orders right now for what they're supposed to be doing, but the world is a little different now than it did just three or four weeks ago. Um, so um, I think a, a, a big problem or a concern that we're seeing more of um, with towns post town meeting is that, that they're being, you know, select boards are under statute, they are required to raise tax revenues um, at um, and set the tax rate at a level that's necessary to raise the amounts that are voted at town meeting. Um, and towns really don't have the authority to um, go elsewhere or, or lower that threshold. Um, I think towns, we've, we're hearing more and more from towns that they want to raise much less um, 
with and and then additionally with that they have to in order to change that and have a revote they have to hold a special town meeting and obviously with the social distancing thing that recreate that creates a um another layer of um of concern and problems um the other issue that i didn't write in the memo but um i thought was worth mentioning um is the you know waiving being able to waive penalty and interest um <clears throat> for late tax payments. Um, so for example, we have seven, I think it's 71 or two or three, it's, it's just over 70 um, municipalities that still have installments to pay for taxes. Um, uh, and so, and a lot of those towns are actually relatively larger communities. Um, I do have a list and um, I could, I'd be happy to send it forward to you um, just to see what those towns are. It's actually quite interesting, but, um, yeah, so there's towns that, you know, for example, they what would like the ability to waive penalty and interest, but under statute, they are not um, allowed to. And it's uh, it, it not only are towns wanting to do this, um, but, you know, it really would impress upon taxpayers that, you know, the towns and cities are sympathetic to their situation and they're um, trying their hard to um, uh, work around some of the issues that everyone is facing, but under statutes, um, they don't have that ability to waive the penalty and interest. They can only waive that penalty and interest um, if it is abated, during abatement hearings, if they um, look for abatements. Um, the league and the state treasurer and the municipal bond bank have been on conference calls every week, sort of getting our heads around the issue of, you know, liquidity and borrowing needs. And we're still, I think maybe this week leading into next week and thereafter, towns are finally sort of the dust is a little bit starting to settle. So they're able to think a little bit further down the road about these needs. Right now, we, we asked a question to towns and cities uh, about a week ago and um, didn't get nearly as many re responses as we were hoping for because everyone was so you know focused on sort of the here and now and not really looking too, too far into the future. But um, we're hoping that we'll be able to wrap our heads around what the um, borrowing um, needs are for communities. So that's my um, that's my update. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them if I know the answer. John Gannon. Thank you, Gwen. Um, I have a couple, several questions. Um, sure. First of all, um, you know, having recently spoken with two of the three hospitals in our area about the lack of PPE. Um, for, for, you know, healthcare workers. Is, is that an issue for town first responders? Um, yes, it, it, we have heard from, um, uh, it, this, there was actually testimony, I believe this week, some of the days are blurring, <laughs> this week in uh, Senate government operations, they were working on a CMS um, law enforcement bill. So they had heard from Drew Hazelton, who is the um, the chair of the EMS um, advisory committee. Um, and so, and they also had um, the Department of Health as well. And it, um, shocking, it's not shocking news that everyone is dealing with these PPE shortages, um, but this is um, a problem that's persistent throughout the state and the nation, um, if not the world. And um, now, you know, this is actually a good thing to flag here is that we have a lot of towns that um, are, have nonprofits that they contract out with for these services, like a rescue inc that Drew Hazelton runs. We have towns that have their own, um, you know, units that they're running on their own, and then we, um, in, and they can be, you know, quote unquote, more professionalized. Um, and then um, some, uh, they or they can contract out with a neighboring. Um, neighbor community to provide those services. So, you know, those costs, whenever they become due, will either be um, explicit in town budgets. Um, again, this goes back to the whole tracking of costs for towns. It'll either be very explicit because you can see, hey, this is the cost of a mask went from $1 to $3. Um, or they will be passed along, for example, like a town that contract out with, the, you know, the nonprofits or neighboring communities, it will be embedded in the eventual increase of costs come the next cycle where they're you know, redoing their contracts um, for services. Um, unless obviously those um, costs are um, absorbed somewhere else from you know, say federal relief if there's a way that you know, that sort of works out. But um, the true cost directly won't be, we won't wrap our heads around with until you know, months and months down the, down the line. But it's, but, it's an, but it's definitely an issue and they're triaging um, at the state level 
And obviously the nurses and doctors and hospital facilities, we've been told get it first. And then um, a very close second is going to be those um, emergency responders, specifically um, EMT, EMS running ambulance services um, and then fire. And then not in, in a more distant third is um, law enforcement, which is also another thing to mention the enforcement across the municipal sheriff and state we are, are now you know just like towns are distancing uh road crew workers um you know and now the vermont local roads for example is working with our towns in terms of like um how to clean out trucks how to clean out graders how to create you know sort of safe quote-unquote work environment especially when towns are sharing equipment um but uh, same thing for law enforcement is that they, you know, are not running calls where there's, you know, two people in a, in a cruiser and they're um, responding to calls sort of in a, um, uh, a more linear um, manner. Um, so, yeah, so that's a good question. Sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent, but. <laughs> no, thank, thank you. And, and sort of a follow up on that is, for, you know, many of our towns rely on volunteers for fire and rescue. Um, are you concerned about the potential out-of-pocket cost to those volunteers who may, you know, contract COVID-19? And is there something we can do about that? Um, it's a great question. Um, we, and this is, uh, you know, you get the best of people in these circumstances. Um, one thing, um, at the bottom of your testimony, this is maybe a good chance to, um, to flag this hour, um, we have a sort of link, which is, you know, an FAQ, sort of a, a, a springboard for our communities. Um, so basically the last three weeks, we've been, you know, hundreds and hundreds of questions about these things. And um, there's, there's uh, communities asking very similar questions. So um, we put, you know, uh, sort of FAQs up about things like, you know, mutual aid, how to deal with um, financing questions, um, you know, cybersecurity for remote work, um, what are essential government functions? What are not essential government functions? And one of the things um, we included is sort of um, working with our risk management who provides um, insurance for um, a vast majority of municipalities and sort of subdivisions of uh, thereof. We have um, risk management for volunteers. Um, we have a lot of um, individuals and communities that you know, are furloughed or not working um, and have big hearts and are wanting to help. So um, communities are trying really hard to um, to help with those needs um, and uh, give people the opportunity to give back to their communities. Now the, the costs incurred, so we can, you know, towns can deal with a sort of risk or sort of minimizing the risk of, you know, bringing people under the fold to help out um, as best as possible through um, just proper um, documentation and agreements and contracting. Um, but the costs move forward, again, we're asking towns to track these numbers just like they would for FEMA reimbursements, but we, you know, and it's fabulous. We're hearing from, you know, the, the Senate Finance Committee and the obviously both appropriations committees and everyone wants to help and we're delighted, um, but we won't know the cost um, fully, you know, until we sort of move the, you know, further down the road for, um, you know, uh, what the true costs are um, be above and beyond what the normal um, costs are for things like, um, volunteers and EMT and those rescue services, so. But I guess what I'm trying to get to is not necessarily the direct cost to towns, but the, the yeah. cost to the volunteers themselves. I, I mean, you know, many oh, sure. volunteers have other jobs um, that they do. And, you know, if they contract COVID-19, you know, saying, sure. you know, doing being a rescue volunteer, um, how are we, is there a way yeah. to help them? Yeah, that's a really, you know, that's a really tough one because you have, again, we did this, we, you could do social distancing um, for things that, you know, I, I wouldn't say they're easy, it's maybe a little bit easier to do things for, um, you know, police and their cruisers or for um, wastewater, op wastewater um, facility operators, but for um, an already stretched EMS system, for system we're already lacking, um, thousands of, of adequate numbers of volunteers um, or employees or officials to basically provide those services, it's being further stretched. Um, from anecdotally speaking, from what I've heard is that because, you know, because of the social distancing measures, because of the fast acting of, you know, our officials in the state, thank God, um, the um, beyond, I think, you know, Washington County, maybe Windsor and certainly Chittenden County has been hit really hard, but thankfully they have really um, robust sort of services already. Um, so 
in one way that's you know really helpful but um so far so good um they uh, again but we haven't reached the peak so again we're not going to really know what the true impacts are um the um the uh because there's no um and this is happening with law enforcement too, the police academy not really running classes they were seven weeks in and had to stop because of this whole um this whole uh, COVID-19 crisis um, kicking in. Same thing is happening with training for onboarding EMS, EMTs, EMRs, paramedics, the whole nine yards. So, you know, it's 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 an added cost um, down the line in terms of like having enough manpower um, available. I will say that we had reached out to, um, you know, we had concerns from a lot of communities who have um, National Guard members on their EMS and EM, uh, they're basically their EMT crews. Um, and there were concerns that if the National Guard was going to be called up, this would um, even further stretch the needs um, for these uh, services. Uh, thankfully, uh, the National Guard is very, is acutely aware <laughs> that that's a concern. And they're overarching goal anyways is to provide you know um, adequate um, services and protection uh, Vermont they, um, have assured um, these crews that they um, will not be calling up any of those folks to um, active duty for the National Guard duties um, to ensure that they are um, able to stick with their sort of nine to five job um, with uh, their ambulance crews so. That's kind of the update I have, but I would perhaps recommend um, uh, reaching out to um, you know Drew Hazelton because um, and actually today at 2 p.m. I think it's at 2 p.m. today um, or no sorry 1 p.m. today um, the EMS advisory committee who which I'm a member of as a rep for Vermont Cities and Towns we're having a meeting um, at one and so I, I guarantee this issue will come up more so um, I can report back or I'm sure somebody else can report back to. Um, on that. If there's any questions you also want me to ask them, I'd be more than happy to pass that along. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I have some more questions, but I'm going to let somebody else ask questions um, because I've taken up a lot of time. We've got all the time in the world, John. We'll come back to you. Just pop your hand up when you're ready to ask another question. Um, Hal's in line now, so we'll go to Hal Colston. Uh, good morning, Gwen. Um, so what trends of frustrations are you hearing from cities and towns? Are there? Um, great question. <laughs> um, I, again, going back to that sort of FAQ um, uh, that's on our website, at the very top of it is sort of the, you know, them, us responding to questions about HR, sort of, you know, we have policies in place, we have, um, you know, systems in place for how we deal with employees. Um, and so um, adjusting policies uh, to deal with the world now, I think like, again, most employers are, you know, these are not unique issues to municipalities. We just happen to be providing governmental services and we're also employers. Um, so uh, how to maneuver HR issues, um, how, to, how to keep government services, no matter how quote unquote, big or small they may be um, moving forward. Um, you know, I, this moving target of knowing when this is gonna be over is, is, is has a, and nobody knows when this is gonna be over necessarily, but not being able to plan for the future and not being able to have, I think the biggest frustration we're hearing from communities is simply not knowing how to plan um, those required, um, you know, things in statute or required, um, you know, meetings that you have to have um, and, and, and not knowing, you know, how to adjust accordingly because it's, it becomes a domino effect. You make a change in the beginning, it has an impact on, on things further down the line. Um, you know, I think, again, I think in the next few weeks is going to be really critical. I think we're going to get a better handle on um, moving from sort of true crisis you know, re responding to a crisis and sort of getting back to a, a, a le level of normality, um, we'll have a better understanding um, of what the needs are. But I think those FAQs are, are, are helpful and at least understanding the questions that we've been getting through the League of Cities and Towns um, because we compiled all of that information purely in response to the questions we've been getting. Um, we didn't we didn't spur them on our own. We um, let the questions we, we were receiving sort of dictate the information we were putting out. Thank you. 
John, shall we come back to you? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so turning um, to open meetings and then finance, um, do you think, as Carol suggested, that we need more guidance for towns with respect to quasi-judicial um, meetings with respect to the new open meeting guidelines? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually, um, I thought it doesn't mean that the other attorneys in the office hadn't thought about that. Um, yeah, I, I would be happy to um, bring that issue up to um, the rest of the attorneys in the office to sort of get um, feedback from them on the necessity to make those adjustments. Um, I think that obviously you're going to have to make some type of adjustments. I'm not, you'd have to get real creative um, with how you uh, do these quasi-judicial hearings without um, having folks um, physically present, but um, uh, I, I'm sure there has to be an answer to those questions. Um, that, that being said, we're already dealing with those issues. Um, not, I shouldn't say we're not dealing with them because a lot of towns have decided simply to put things off um, things like um, appeal hearings for, you know, zoning permits, for example, um, towns simply are not, um, they're just pushing the, um, those dates off into the future and sort of crossing their fingers that um, they can get it done sooner rather than later. Um, but that's, um, that's a great question that I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to you um, with any um, input that we might have. Okay. And, and you should probably take a look at the BCA appeal process for, for property. Yeah, that, 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 and that's the thing is it's very specific in statute. You brought that up is that it's very yep. specific in statute. So in order to, if, even if it's on an emergency basis, like we're, you know, dealing with right now, we want to make sure we get it right. You know, we want to make sure that any adjustments we make really truly are helpful and are providing that balance of, um, you know, ev everyone having their constitutional rights being, um, uh, valued and, um, and so, yeah, so yeah, we're, that's a great, uh, great point. So now turning to a similar question, but related to finances. Um, so as you, as you testified already, we anticipate that tax abatements are probably gonna increase. Um, I, I know at least in Wilmington, most of the tax abatements we do are, are very unique situations where a home burned down or, or something similar, where there's a major property loss. Um, but now we're probably going to be looking at more tax abatements um, that concern people's inability to pay, which the, the towns already have statutory authority to do. Um, but my question is, you know, when a town grants a tax abatement, um, they have to make up to the education fund um, yeah. its share of any abated taxes. Um, it, have you discussed that or thought about how to address that problem for a municipality? Um, yeah, this is this uh, going back to what um, uh, I think I mentioned was that uh, Karen Horn, um, our the director of advocacy, um, she had testified uh, two or three times this week on that very issue. Well, not just that very issue, but um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Uh, towns will have to make the Ed Fund whole. Um, so it's the topic of discussion. I, this is going to be obviously beyond what VLCT. Um, uh, how, how we feel about things, but I know the Department of Taxes um, and the, the money committees are keenly um, aware of this issue. And I think they're still just trying to sort out, um, again, it's a moving target. You don't know how many, how big, how prolific, you know, it, uh, putting a circle around this, um, this issue is really hard to do at this point, but it's, um, it's uh, an issue everyone is very aware of. And that's not very helpful, but we know that um, it's going to have to be, there's going to have to be some sort of legislative fix or some sort of legislative flexibility um, working with, you know, the Department of Taxes um, as well to, um, to address this if there is a big onslaught of um, abatement requests um, coming through. Yeah. Uh, and one last question, um, given the liquidity issues in the municipal bond market right now, um, does the state have to look for alternatives um, for towns um, to get financing? Yeah, so we're in the infancy stages. We're in the infancy stages of having those discussions with uh, Beth Pierce and um, the executive director of the Municipal Bond Bank. Um, so I, we uh, have a call at 3 p.m. I don't know, it's either today or Monday, but um, we've been doing at least weekly check-ins on this. 
um, very issue. And um, everything's changing really quickly um, in terms of how banks are dealing with um, lending, how the, 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 the bond market looks like, you brought that up earlier. Um, it is, um, it's scary. <laughs> Um, and uh, we don't have an answer to that question just yet, but uh, do know that we are working with the bigger brains um, to figure out uh, what the needs are. And again, we have that we have those questions going. And again, everyone is really trying to be parents, trying to be you know working from home. Um, you know, it's it's there's a lot going on. Um, so when we put these surveys out for you know questioning our our members, you know, we all, we always have trouble getting full data, but um, even for things like this, saying you know, what are your needs are, it's it's hard to get um, it's hard to get clear feedback from our communities just when they're dealing with this sort of crisis management, and they again don't know exactly what the um, what the numbers are going to look like um, going forward for what the what the needs are for borrowing. But you know, again, looking at the 71 or 72 or 73 towns or cities that still have that last final installment for tax payments. Um, there, I mean, we heard from Burlington. I think they were borrowing, you know, a million or over a million. I can't remember exactly the, the number, but there, there, there could be large numbers um, depending on um, the size of the grand list. Um, so, um, I, I, I'd say to be determined and stay tuned. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Any other questions from committee members for Gwen? All right. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. And and uh, turning off your video helped us a bit to be able to to hear you. So I appreciate you doing that. And you're welcome to turn it back on if you want <clears throat> to listen in on the rest of the meeting. Uh, so welcome to Rob, who's just joined us from another meeting. Good morning, Rob. We are running through municipal and school boards perspectives on how to continue operating uh, in the COVID-19 world. So let's go to Sue Siglowski now, and, um, and she's the executive director of the School Boards Association. Where, there you are, Sue. Thank you for being with us Thank this morning. You. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's nice to meet all of you uh, electronically and look forward to a day when we can all be back in the state house as normal. I don't know when that will be, but I look forward to that. Um, my name is Sue Siglowski and I'm the executive director of the Vermont School Boards Association. Wanted to thank you for the opportunity to give you an update on um, COVID-19 response and, and what's happening with um, school boards. Um, just before I get started on that, I just wanted to um, uh, applaud the entire Vermont education community for um, pulling together in response to this crisis. It really has been an all hands on deck um, situation and everyone has been um, contributing in enormous ways. The first uh, item I wanted to talk about um, involves the temporary elections provisions. On Monday, Governor Scott signed H-681, which um, as you know, establishes temporary elections provisions that are intended to allow Vermonters to continue to participate in elections, but also um, in a way that protects public health and safety. And um, I won't, go over what those provisions are. I'm sure you know what they are. One of them that I wanted to highlight was that um, the legislation um, grants the Secretary of State authority in um, conjunction with the governor to order or permit appropriate procedures as necessary in light of the COVID-19 virus. And that includes um, the possibility of mail balloting. The SBA has notified school boards about those temporary election provisions. Um, we sent that out to them shortly after the governor signed them into law. Uh, they have direct relevance for the school boards who, um, whose budgets have not been voted on yet or whose budgets were defeated on town meeting day. Um, on Wednesday, we received an elections bulletin from the elections division of the Vermont Secretary of State's office. That's the bulletin that Carol Dawes was um, referring to in her testimony. And the Secretary of State's office asked us to distribute that widely to, um, to school boards and their attorneys, which we did. 
and I um, just wanted to give you a brief summary of that bulletin because I think it might be helpful. Um, it stated that the Secretary of State had reached an agreement with the governor earlier this week to allow cancellation of municipal elections mandated to be held on or before a certain date. For those who have elections coming up in April or May, the Secretary of State's guidance in that bulletin is to cancel all of those meetings, if at all possible. Um, this is a um, one sentence quote from, from the guidance, whether they are votes from the floor or Australian ballot votes that require processing and counting, the processes required at this time to conduct the election put voters and election workers at too much risk from this highly contagious virus. That's the end of the quote. On the topic of, of budget revotes, the guidance states that there is no time frame in, in election law in which a budget revote must be held for votes um, that by charter, article of agreement, or by law are required to be held on or before a certain date. The governor has agreed under the authority granted to the Secretary of State in Section 3 of H681 to allow those elections to be canceled as well. The stated objective is to see if votes can be conducted safely in late spring or early summer. And if that is not possible to provide some time for the Secretary of State's office to devise and implement appropriate procedures to allow local elections to take place more safely. The SBA has communicated this guidance to school boards and you will be hearing um, from two school board chairs today about how their boards plan to proceed. Um, next, just touch briefly on the um, temporary open meeting law changes. Those were also in H681, um, removing the designated physical meeting location, um, setting out the, uh, how the public needs to be able to access electronic meetings and requiring that um, school boards record their meetings um, during this time period. So we've um, communicated those changes as well to school boards and posted information on our website. Um, we've also pre prepared um, some guidance on organizing and conducting electronic school board meetings, which um, has been sent out. And moving forward, school boards will have a vital, vital role to play by staying connected to their communities, although it will be remotely, and working with their superintendents to provide calm and positive leadership through this crisis. Um, we are sending out a survey today to uh, all school board members uh, asking for their um, input and um, ideas on um, what, what they're having uh, trouble with so that we can provide resources for them um, and have better information to inform um, you when we're asked to testify. I believe that is the um, conclusion of my testimony, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Hey, Jim Harrison has a question. Yeah, hi, Sue. So, uh, thank you for the update. Um, this is very helpful. Um, I'm curious if um, obviously most school budgets have passed. Um, they passed a month ago under arguably a different uh, set of scenarios and expectations. Uh, do you know if any school boards, and may, this may be really premature, but as new economic circumstances um, uh, going forward, uh, if they wanted to revisit their budget, you know, this summer, what would the process for doing that? My second question is, are you aware of any layoffs um, in the school systems uh, that have happened? And uh, if so, um, what, what is our role in terms of helping them with the um, UI fund uh, experience for those school districts? I, uh, to answer your second question, I'm not aware of any layoffs. Um, the teachers are still teaching and the, um, the bus drivers are delivering meals to students. Um, I know that people are um, working it maybe in some different ways than they had been, um, but I'm not aware of any layoffs. 
And uh, I think it's a little premature um, to have information about whether boards are reconsidering budgets. Um, they are just getting started with this um, remote meeting. Uh, the law went into effect on Monday, so they're just getting started this week with meeting remotely. Um, that certainly is um, information that I could um, collect. Um, I would note though that um, they, many of them um, have deadlines in um, right in this time frame that we're in right now um, for um, getting contracts out um, and those contracts are based on the budget and, and most budgets are um, about 80% of the budget is um, salaries and benefits. Yeah, no, I understand that. Uh, but if there are, are there provisions that we may need to look at that would give school districts flexibility if come August, they're looking at a, an entirely different economic scenario uh, with property tax base or, um, for example, sales tax revenues going into the Ed Fund uh, are not likely to be what was anticipated. Uh, so um, unfortunately, we may have some very, very hard decisions in front of us. And I'm just asking a hypothetical question um, to prepare for that while we're in session. Is there something we need to pass that would give the school board the authority to reopen their budget in spite of the fact that it had been duly adopted back in March? I could certainly um, try to gather some information for you about that. Um, I would note that there's a lot of moving pieces to the situation because we um, yesterday there was testimony to a joint hearing of the House Education Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee um, by Mark Peralt from JFO um, having to do with the Federal CARES Act and the um, funds that are gonna be coming into the state um, specifically targeted to education from the Federal CARES Act, and that was um, like $31.1 million. Um, so all of, all of um, the moving pieces, I think, need to, and the pieces of the puzzle need to be um, considered together to get a, an accurate um, understanding of uh, what's happening with education finance. So committee, are there any other questions for Sue? Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands, so feel free to pop your hand up if you have a question for Sue, but we have been at this uh, for, for over an hour, close to an hour and a half, and I've had a request for a five minute break. So I'm gonna invite you all to, um, to stop video and stand up and stretch or do a jumping jack or run to the restroom. And we will aim to get back here at 1046. So I will I see you all in five minutes. That, so uh, that request did not come from me, Madam Chair. <laughs> all right, see you all in five minutes. All right, I see we've got plenty of folks back on with us and I appreciate the excuse to take a break. When we do that in the building, it's always at least a 10 minute break because anytime you go out the door, you get, you get grabbed by somebody who wants to just quickly tell you something. So um, less, less of a challenge in, uh, in our current circumstance unless the cat intercepted you and wanted to remind you that you haven't fed her yet. Um, so we have two uh, school board chairs who would like to share some sort of on the ground perspective from us. And so I think we'll go to Martha Heath first and welcome Martha, it's nice to see your face. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Um, for the record, my name is Martha Heath and I, Chair of the Essex Westford School District Board. Um, our her district is comprised of the communities of Essex Town, Essex Junction, and Westford. We educate approximately 4,000 students in 10 schools 
and were responsible for a technical center. Um, our district is one of the districts that has not yet voted on their school budget um, because of the traditions in Essex Town and Essex Junction of voting school budgets on the second Tuesday in April. And there are some connections to what happens with the municipality of the town of Essex as well for why it's that late. Um, we haven't voted yet. Um, our meeting, our vote and the annual meeting was scheduled to take place on April 13th and 14th. We have canceled those meetings, um, but given the guidance we received yesterday that not to try to hold any kind of meeting in, or vote in April or May, we are on hold at this point. Um, one of the challenges that's facing my district and others who either haven't held their first vote or who had their first vote defeated um, is that obviously the onset of the pandemic and given the financial challenges and the general unease that our voters are experience, experiencing, we're concerned about the ramifications for our students that could be very different from the students in districts that already have a budget. Um, as many of you may know, by law, we are allowed to borrow 87% of our budget if we of our previous year's budget. If we do not have a voter approved budget by July 1st, um, in order to operate, but obviously we would prefer to have a budget before the fiscal year begins. Um, I testified yesterday in front of Ways and Means and Education, um, those two committees. Today, I'll, I'll confine my testimony to issues that are related to specifically to um, your committee. So because the Secretary of State's office is recommending not to hold meetings in April or May, and because of the uncertainty of our situation, um, we're wondering what you would think about changing the warning period of 30 to 40 days. Um, in other words, when we do finally uh, warn a vote, um, it can't take place for 30 to 40 days after the date of that warning. Um, so we're wondering if you would consider waiving that period during this financial crisis um, and health crisis. Um, the second issue is that um, we can move most of our annual, I think we can move virtually all of our annual meeting questions to Australian ballot, but school boards are required to hold budget information hearings. So could there be a provision that would allow us to hold that hearing through some electronic means? Um, and 
find me, I think, the provision that allows for an election to be held entirely by a Australian ballot could be helpful. Um, in talking with our town clerks, they're quite concerned about the cost of um, ordering ballots for everyone. And so we're wondering what you would think of holding an election not only by Australian ballot, but still requiring voters to request a ballot. Um, sorry. <laughs> I think those are the issues that are on our minds right now. There's undoubtedly more that will come up, but those are the ones that are related to issues that your com committee would be talking about and thinking about. So thank you. All right, John Gannon has a question. All right, I'm gonna move to mute you for one second. Sure. <laughs> Nice to have a dog participate. Doesn't happen very often. That's right. Apparently, he had a question. <laughs> Go ahead, John. He, this moment that he decided to wake up. Sorry. Okay, um, John. So, Martha, I, I have a question about um, uh, the school boards having to have information sessions. Is it your belief that that's not covered by the changes we made to open meeting law? Um, that's a good question. Um, we could seek some guidance on that. Okay. All right. I, I was just tr trying to figure out if, you know, if that was covered. I guess we can check with the Secretary of State's office. Thank you. Okay. So committee, any other questions for Martha at this moment? All right. Well, feel free to toss up a hand if you have one. And otherwise, we will switch gears and go to Tim Smith of Slate Valley. Is that correct? That's correct. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thank All you right. for being with us today. Thank you very much for, for having me, Sarah. Um, so I've got a few things I can cover here today. I'll start quickly with just a, a personal introduction. Uh, again, my name is Tim Smith. I'm the chair of the Slate Valley uh, Unified School District. Um, personally, I'm a CPA. I work for a public accounting firm in Rutland. Uh, my wife is a teacher. Uh, we have two boys ages 12 and nine. And like everyone else, we're adjusting to this new normal of both working and uh, teaching from home. Um, our district recently consolidated per Act 146. <clears throat> Prior to that, I served on uh, my local town Castleton School Board for six years, two of which were uh, in the capacity of chair. And this is my second year as a member of the Slate Valley Unified School Board. Uh, we're located in Western Rutland County along the Route 4 corridor, uh, six towns, Castleton, Hubbardton, Fairhaven, West Haven, Benson, and Orwell. And we service uh, 1,261 kids in our district. Um, I had the privilege yesterday of testifying before the Vermont Ed and House Ways and Means Committees, and I spoke about a variety of concerns, COVID and otherwise. Um, I don't think a lot of that is applicable for testimony today. Um, a couple things. Uh, I was asked to come here today because our vote, uh, our school budget did go down on town meeting day. So we are in the position where we are going to have to hold a revote. Um, we also had a very large uh, bond vote on town meeting day, uh, $59.5 million, uh, which I think outside of South Burlington was the largest in the state. And the purpose of that $59.5 million bond was to address critical infrastructure repairs and then the construction of a district middle school for grades seven and eight on location of the high school. So certainly that was a hot topic of debate amongst our six communities. Uh, ultimately the bond vote went down 78 points to 22 points. 
I think a very similar vote total to that of South Burlington. However, our school budget went down by a very small margin, 52 points no, 48 points yes, that's 95 votes. So if you had asked me two to three weeks ago whether I was confident our school budget would pass, certainly I thought it was going to. Traditionally, our towns have been very supportive of the schools, but now given the circumstances and how events have developed, I, I don't really know how people are going to respond to a budget revote of any sort. Um, initially, we did um, warn a revote that was uh, scheduled to take uh, place in mid-April. And as mentioned by others, per advice of the Secretary of State, we have rescinded that warning. And now we're in a, a holding pattern, uh, like everyone else, a wait and see. Uh, certainly, it's our preference to have a budget passed and in place by uh, June 30th. So whether we can do that with an in-person vote or it's going to be a mail-in vote, I, I guess is going to be uh, yet to be seen. Um, so quickly, um, you know, revenues and layoffs, those, uh, those have been brought up by other uh, people thus far. Um, it, it's been pretty much, um, I certainly don't want to say business as usual, but I guess my point being, we've not had any layoffs. You know, all staff, bus uh, services, et cetera, everyone is being paid. Uh, there are certainly under contract in a lot of cases through the end of the year. Um, so it's status quo in that sense. Um, and in terms of cash flows and revenues, I, I think uh, in, after discussing this with the finance or the business manager yesterday, I, I think we're in pretty good shape uh, outside of the last expected payment from the education fund, which for us approximates about $2.7 million. And I, I'm understanding that that is most likely directly related to the fact that we still have some towns in our district who have one more installment of property taxes due in May. Um, so moving along now to more uh, remote meeting, budget revote concerns. Um, so certainly, yes, I, I've read the, the legislation signed by Governor Scott, H681, which gives us a lot of uh, flexibility, um, gives him a lot of flexibility, I should say, to designate the Secretary of State to really make any changes they feel necessary given the COVID issues at hand. I guess I'd like to know sooner or later whether or not we are going to move to a mail-in voting system because if that, uh, if it's deemed that we're not going to have the opportunity to have an in-person vote, which at this point seems not likely, then knowing that we're going to have a mail-in vote, if we had that information sooner or later, that would be certainly most helpful. Uh, because again, this is going to involve six towns and the town clerks and each of the six towns and, and the printing and the mailing of those ballots out to individuals, giving them uh, an appropriate amount of time to, to cast that ballot, to mail it back, to harvest, collect and count. So there's a lot of mechanisms that would need to happen over the next 60 days to make that a reality. So if it is going to be mail in, I'd like to know sooner than later. Um, Jim Harrison, you brought up some points earlier about uh, you know towns that had passed their school budget, revisiting them over the summertime, uh, given uh, the circumstances. Uh, certainly, we don't have a school budget, but just to put a few things in perspective, um, when we had uh, warned a revote, uh, we had uh, reduced what few expenditure increases we had in our original budget. So our expenditure increases were zero. And that was uh, uh, spending per equalized pupil of $16,500, which was a 2.99% increase over prior year. And that compared favorably uh, to other schools in our district. Um, you know, if we were to think that, okay, we really need to take a bigger cut out of this apple and, and lower our budget even more to make it more palatable, um, we would have to cut um, 350, 000, approximately $350,000 per, to realize 1% savings. 
so if we had a 2.99% increase in equalized pupil and we wanted to uh, bring that to zero or no increase, we would have to cut approximately $1 million from a $26 million budget. Now, again, this is all in how things are worded on the warning. As you know, it was changed here in the last couple of years. Again, our expenditures are flat. We're, 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 we don't have any increases in expenditures, but how things are written now on the warnings with a education spending per pupil and an increase compared to prior year, of course, everyone's struggling with a decline in equalized pupils. And that's why those percentages keep going up and of course the voters are gonna see that percentage increase and that automatically causes alarm, despite the fact that our expenditures, what we can control are flat. Um, and then to Marsha's point earlier, you know, we can borrow what 87% uh, if we don't from of a prior year budget, if we don't have a budget in place by July 1st, I mean, that would, that would basically amount to a three and a half million dollar reduction in our budget. Um, you know, 80% of our costs are, are personnel and healthcare related. And another thing that I discussed yesterday is per terms of our master agreement with the NEA, we have to give reduction in force notices, RIF notices by March 15th. That time has passed. So we can't even cut personnel to even begin to realize the amount of cuts that we would have to take place if we were only allowed to take 87% of prior year budget. So, you know, our hands are really tied. There's really not, not much we can cut unless, unless the situation or the rules of the game change dramatically. Um, what else could I say? Um, You know, uh, in terms of remote meetings, you know, our, our district has has made the adjustments. Uh, we had our first school board meeting two weeks ago, remotely via a, a Google uh, platform. Uh, in that meeting, I was physically in a space with the superintendent at the high school. Uh, since that point in time, the rules have been changed even more. Uh, we do not need to provide a physical space. I do not need to be physically present with the superintendent. So for our next meeting scheduled for Monday, uh, everyone will be remote using a Google platform. And, you know, we will be advertising both through, uh, you know, posting it on our school district website and through Front Porch Forum. Uh, how the public can log on to that meeting virtually and participate. Um, so, you know, it's always hard to get the public to participate um, under the old circumstances. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see if people are, are more able or less able to participate in this virtual environment. Um, but we're doing the best that we can. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say. I'll certainly uh, take any questions. Um, you know, the landscape is changing so quickly for everybody and there's a lot of uncertainty. So I, I guess as a school district, we're really just trying to focus on those small steps that we can plan for and, and actions that we can take now, given the known variables, because there are still a lot of unknown variables. So any questions? Thank you, Tim, and uh, and I just want to give a shout out to to you and Martha both. I know that uh, this has been an unprecedented <clears throat> uh, time of change for you all, and uh, and figuring out how to adapt and adjust um, to one of these most fundamental uh, services that we provide um, in a time of social distancing is uh, challenging to say the least. So I appreciate you taking some time to, to be with us this morning. Uh, I've got Jim Harrison and then John Gannon with questions. Go ahead, Jim. Sure, thank you. Yeah, Tim, thank you very much for, um, for joining us and, <coughs> and sharing uh, some of your experience uh, in the nearby Western Rutland County. Um, I guess what I was asking before was not whether school budgets should change going forward, um, but certainly the landscape may change. It may be for the better if we get a lot of federal funds, um, but we just don't know that as Sue pointed out. And uh, all I'm asking, and maybe you know the answer, maybe you don't, but 
if you had adopted a budget uh, last month, as you had hoped, um, put aside the bond issue for now. Yeah. Um, if your circumstances changed in three months, four months, six months, do you have the ability as a school board to go back and change the current year budget? Uh, do you have to go back to the voters or is that not even an option at that point? I'm, that's what I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. Do we need to allow for that in our laws? Um, not that we hope to use it, just, you know, we, we don't, we're not typically in session in August or September. This year we may be, who knows, but um, um, we, we can't help you when we're not in session. Um, yeah, I guess I, I don't, I don't have authoritative guidance to, to, to answer your question. I can just offer my opinion again, which would be, uh, if we had a successful budget pass on town meeting day, would we now be looking at revisiting that uh, over the course of the summer? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I guess it all depends on how the situation uh, unfolds. Um, I mean, you'd like to think that the, the fundamental mechanisms in place are going to remain in place, and that once we get past this, uh, you know, next school year will will be operating under the same parameters. Um, so I, I would not anticipate that we would be looking to revise our budget had it passed. Um, but again, you know, this year finishing up fiscal year 20 is not the issue. It's next year, 21. No one knows what that's gonna look like with government funds coming in and uh, people's ability to pay property taxes and the sales tax revenue and all the other <clears throat> sources that go into the education fund. So yeah. I, I, guess, I don't know. Yeah, no, no, and I, I appreciate that. And I, I'm just trying to, and I don't know education law very well. So, um, I, I just want to know if there is flexibility to revisit something given extraordinary circumstances that we may be faced and we don't even know what the budget implications are going to be. And again, they may be positive and we don't have to make any changes or maybe an opportunity to do something else with infrastructure. I don't know. Um, the other question I have for you, and again, this may be more of a question for the Ed Committee, but if you're unable to take a vote or unable to get a budget passed, either way, um, in the next few months, other than the current 87% of last year, is there something that the state can do that would say allow the agency of ed to impose a budget, you know, that maybe is 100% of last year? Uh, not more, not the 3% increase that you had hoped for, um, but at least keep you whole from last year's perspective. Can, can our, does this, our state law allow that? And if not, should we consider something like that? Well, I can't answer the question as to whether or not the state law allows for it, but, but certainly if, if that law exists and it was changed to instead allow for 87% to allow for a 100% of prior year budget, I think that's certainly something that we could make work. Um, the 87%, as I mentioned previously, would require some drastic cuts, un unreason unrealistic cuts, unless we fundamentally change the way that we deliver education. So, um, you know, I'm an optimistic sort. <laughs> I, I, I hope this passes like I'm sure everyone does. I'm also hopeful that um, if we are given the guidance as to the mail-in balloting that ultimately we will have a successful revote and, and we won't quite have to worry about that 87% number. So for me, the most pressing issue is getting the go ahead to do the mail-in vote so we can work with our town clerks and make that happen. And I can communicate and others can communicate with our communities to get that vote out um, to express our, you know, our, our empathies for the situation at hand, but ultimately to get a positive vote. And I, I'm optimistic that we can still do that. I just need to know if it's going to be mail or in person. All right. I've got a couple of committee members in the queue, but Martha Heath has raised her hand. And I just wanted to say, Martha, were you raising your hand to respond to Jim Harrison's question? All right, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks. So 
Jim, to answer parts of your question, I don't believe there's anything in law that allows us to borrow more than 87% of our previous year's budget. That also doesn't, um, that's still not a voted budget. So you have to keep going back to the voters until you get an approved budget. And I've been at my local school board since 1985. And I have once been through a situation where we had to vote three times to get a voter approved budget. Um, there are some laws about, which I can't quote, about what the towns have to raise. So they send out an initial property tax bill. So some money goes to the Ed Fund. And then when a budget is finally approved, that there's an addendum to the tax bills that um, goes out. So there isn't a ton of flexibility. I think school districts themselves have some opportunities. For instance, if people don't sign contracts to look at the position and think carefully about whether it's a position that's needed or could be covered in some other way. School districts sometimes put free, a freeze on buying supplies and things like that. But as Tim pointed out, that's not a lot of money. Frankly, a huge portion of our increase in our budget this year came from the state, um, I won't call it a settlement, the imposed um, agreement around healthcare for education workers. And obviously those kinds of things are things we can't make adjustments to. Thanks. All right, I have John Gannon and then Rob LeClaire. Go ahead, John. Uh, Tim, th thank you for testifying today. Sure. Um, I actually had a question about um, the current situation in your school, and I should have asked Martha this too, or your school district, which is, you know, how is the distance learning and the non-congregate meals and all the other things that have to be implemented impacting your budget? Is it, is it hurting you or helping you? And then second question is, are you getting enough guidance from the Agency of Education to implement um, those changes? Okay, thanks. Um, I don't think we've experienced any additional costs uh, because of the situation and the remote learning. Um, first, to your point about the transportation and the meals, um, you know, we have a contract with our, our busing uh, company. Um, certainly, there are savings because there are no extracurricular activities. We are still paying them for our contracted uh, student pickup and drop off. Um, and in this case, there's no students, so they're doing meal deliveries, at least for the time being. So uh, there hasn't really been any added costs or savings, really. We're kind of operating as, as normal in that sense. Um, I guess, secondly, uh, however, um, and I mentioned this yesterday to the Vermont uh, Ed Committee, um, we would have concerns uh, in the future about the the social and emotional impact of the situation and, and what it has on our children. And we could anticipate that there being additional needs and costs going forward in the way of counselors, clinicians, guidance, you know, guidance counselors, et cetera, to help, to help the kids um, recover from this. Uh, you know, my wife, who is a teacher, I, I talked about this with her last night. Um, you know, we'd really, if it's safe to do so, like to get the kids back into the school at some point this year, even if it's just for a couple weeks, not to learn, but to start, but to, to reconnect and to start that healing process. Uh, if people think that, you know, we're going to show up to school next uh, September 1st, ready to 
start learning again like nothing ever happened that's not realistic there's definitely an impact on the kids and it's going to take quite a bit of time i think to to for them to speak out let their emotions come out start that that healing process before we can bet get back to to actual uh, learning um, in regards to whether or not we've received enough guidance from the Vermont Department of Education, um, certainly my superintendent would be better answer, better, better able to answer that question. I know she's constantly in contact with Secretary French and others. Um, you know, they they had released a uh, a template uh, maybe a week ago. And I think uh, yesterday they received some more concrete guidance on what the continuity and education plan looks like. And um, I think to my satisfaction, it appears at least that the expectations um, educationally have been lowered. You know, we're not going to expect as much from our kids uh, on, on educational progress, which I think is, is realistic. Um, we need to prioritize the physical and mental well-being of the kids, I think, more so than educational progress. Um, you know, um, I asked at our last school board meeting uh, how many people were successfully able to access the the internet and, uh, and, and, and doing the remote learning via computer versus paper, because there is an equity issue, you know, some families in our community do not have access to internet. And uh, to my surprise and delight, uh, you know, the majority of our families and kids are participating via electronic media, the Chromebooks that they have, and are able to do some something of the, the distance learning. We have a very few amount of people who are still working on a paper only approach where there's designated times to pick up a new class material and then turn in completed class material. So by and large, we are operating in a remote virtual environment and having some success with that. Thank you. Sure. Martha Heath in response to John Gannon's question. Yes, thanks. So I certainly agree with everything that Tim has said. Um, I spoke with our superintendent yesterday. <laughs> Sorry about my dog. Um, one of the things that she thinks it's coming is having to have an expansion. <laughs> Sorry, hold up. It's just like my kids used to be when I got out on the telephone. Um, so she's thinking that we may have to have an expanded summer school operation because not very many, but there are families who just aren't cooperating and aren't um, making sure that their kids are, they are um, learning. Um, taking advantage of the learning opportunities that are being provided. Um, I think in terms of are we saving money, I think our business folks have just started to think about that a little. One area they've identified is that we aren't paying substitutes right now. Um, but that's not a whole lot of money. And um, yeah, it's just not a whole lot of money. Thank you. Great. Okay, I have Rob LeClaire and then Hal Colston. Go ahead, Rob. Thank you. Uh, actually, John had uh, asked my question, but I will make a comment that based on what I heard on the call that I was on earlier this morning, we will be in session some way, shape, or form in August. I don't believe that we're going to be in session from now through to then, but there is discussions about us being in session in some official capacity in August. <sighs> All right, Hal Colston. 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a question for Tim, Sue, or Martha. So how are you mitigating the equity issues that are uh, pre presenting because of uh, distance learning? Uh, I can speak first to that. Um, how are we mitigating the equity issues? Um, we're doing the best we can. It's impossible really to make it, I guess you could say a fair playing field as we would have the opportunity to do so if, if everyone was together in a common location at a school. Um, I did mention that those who do not have internet access are still being uh, given the opportunity to pick up uh, paper material, printouts, worksheets, assignments, et cetera, from the school and then having the ability to, to return those assignments when completed. I, I would foresee that that would continue. I guess it has to in, in the absence of an internet connection. Um, I can't really speak specifically to the special education uh, issues at hand. Certainly there are some kids who who are on IEPs and 504s and have other needs. Um, I, I think we're doing the best we can. I'm not sure how those needs are being met. I, I do know that we, we don't have anybody going physically to children's homes to provide services. That's, that's not allowed. Um, I guess to finish up, <laughs> Uh, this is hard. We're doing the best we can. And ideally, the best situation is to be in a school. So we all just hope that we can get back to that point as, as soon as possible. Thank you. Martha, do you have anything you want to add on the question of equity? Um, I would just say that I think our administrative team is highly cognizant of those issues and talking and thinking about it all the time in the younger grades our teachers are calling families if they can't video conference with them and talking to them at least once a week sometimes more about how things are going what they can do um, I think services like OT and PT and things like that are being provided online to the extent that they can be, but there's no question that special education is a challenge and um, families that are struggling just to put food on the table and can't really focus on their children's learning are an issue. It's, it's just hard. So I have a question for Tim and Martha. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I have struggled to understand is uh, if we have buses that are being deployed to, uh, to help provide meals for kids, um, why are school districts so far unable to use those buses to also deliver educational materials? So Tim, you had mentioned that, that you know, people who don't have internet access can still you know, pick up and drop off uh, paper materials, um, but you know, there are plenty of families around the state who, who don't even have reliable transportation. Um, and so I'm just wondering if we've got these buses heading out, why aren't we using them to deliver instruction? Yeah, um, I guess I'll have to ask for some more specifics from my superintendent as to why that can or cannot happen. I mean, keep in mind too, that these are bus drivers, you know, they're, 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 they're paid to pick up and deliver a child safely. Now they're being asked to handle food and deliver food. I mean, that's kind of outside their purview. And now we're gonna ask them to identify which students on their route they're expected to collect homework from and deliver homework to. It's, it's a lot to ask of a, a bus driver. <laughs> I'm not even sure we're allowed to do that. I, I'm gonna have to get some more uh, information on that. I, I'm not sure the staying power of deploying our buses even to the extent of delivering meals. So 
that's kind of a fluid situation, at least as far as I know. Mike Merwicki, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Well, that, that is happening, in fact, in our district here. And the buses are not going out alone. They're going out with, with uh, school personnel, um, people that don't have access to the internet are getting um, packages from, from, from teachers and uh, that's getting delivered right along with the food. So that option is there. I think that's an important um, way of achieving some, some semblance of equity. So I, I have uh, been frustrated at my local district for saying that they cannot, for some reason, cannot put educational materials on those buses. Um, Martha, did you have any perspective on that? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing Mike did. We certainly have support staff who um, can be used for those kinds of functions. So in our district, meals are being picked up at congregate sites, but we're, except for Westford, generally more urban type of district. Um, but I would say there's no reason you can't put support staff on the bus with the, with the people distributing meals to get materials to and from students. Thank you. Um, committee, any other questions for any of the folks who are with us here today? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Go ahead and do a physical wave if you need to. Sure. Um, yes. Sure. If I Is it okay if I excuse myself from the meeting if there are no further questions? I, I've got two kids that are about to pound down this door. So. <laughs> oh, wait, we would love to see that. <laughs> Thank you, Tim, for being with us. And thank you for all the work you're doing in this unprecedented time. So. All right. Thank you as well. Thank, have a good day. <clears throat> all right. Seeing no uh, other hands raised from committee, I think we are, uh, we are done with the official part of our meeting. Um, and so thank you, Martha, for being with us. Thank you, Gwen, for being with us. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate you. Uh, Carol Dawes has already left the meeting. And um, so we, uh, we will shift over to a, a few announcements and committee discussion here before we sign off for the day. Um, so you're welcome to, to stay on if you like, or you can um, say your goodbyes and go on to another virtual meeting. <laughs> so appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so committee, we have a few things on our agenda for next week. Um, uh, 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 we are also waiting for a new master committee schedule for next week. Um, IT wants to be able to give one more week of, um, of more hands-on support to committees as they are setting up Zoom meetings. So we may or may not get our morning time slots that we had talked about um, using for next week. So I will apologize in advance if the agenda comes out and it's uh, different than what we had discussed. Um, but IT does need to give <clears throat> one more week of, of sort of gatekeeping and, and hands-on support before they give us the green light to schedule our own committee meetings. So um, as you probably can predict, we're going to continue to stay on these issues of sort of um, cleanup and, uh, and mid-range COVID response questions. Um, we've got a, a list of things that the Senate Committee um, on Government Operations has been working on, and we will uh, have uh, uh, Betsy Ann and Tucker present some of those issues to us at some point next week, whenever we get scheduled. We will also have um, um, an Everbridge training with, uh, with a chief of police uh, so that we can practice that, um, that electronic format as well. So if you could please before um, next Tuesday, get Everbridge, um, uh, follow the chief's instructions on how to create your account on Everbridge, and then also um, get it on your phone if you are inclined to do that. And uh, that way you'll have the ability to ask questions about how to use it 
um, both on your iPad and on your phone. Um, and I think that's all that I have for announcements. Anybody else have a question or comment or announcement? Go ahead and unmute yourself and jump right in. Uh, Sarah, do, do we want to start working on the um, things around the Board of Civil Authority? Um, like just ask, I think it would be Tucker, um, whether open meeting applies that process and quasi judicial process. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think we do because, um, you know, there are, I've heard of a couple instances in my community where, um, you know, there, there may have been a change of use that was sort of on the verge of being approved and, uh, and all of a sudden those meetings have been canceled. And, you know, if you are a business and you were 90% of the way through some expansion, um, now is not the time to be sitting around and, and uh, waiting needlessly. So I think if we can do a little more work on that and give some clarity, that would be helpful. Great. Uh, Sarah, can I ask a question? You sure can. Um, and some of you probably know the answer and I don't, but you know, if you were to put your house on the market today, the value of that house may be very different than it was two, two months ago, um, or maybe six months from now. Um, does our law, and I'm not, I'm not advocating this because I almost think you need to take a time out, but can someone uh, challenge the appraisal value of their house or business or whatever property right now? And what if they did, what's it based on? Is it based on the market today or is it based on the normal market that we might've had two months ago? I just, I just fear, I mean, if everybody jumped in on that, I mean, we'd all be raising that question and all of a sudden the value of the real estate for the town, for the school, for whatever, um, would be dramatically different than it is today. Right. That's a great question. Rob? Well, you know, if you're talking about appealing your, your tax appraisal, usually what happens is they don't necessarily take fair market value. They go through and they have a a matrix, a computer program that the appraisers or listers use to help come up with that value. So they don't not like it's not like a regular appraisal through a, a bank or something that's going to go through, look at your property and then go out and take a look at comps. Now, they will take a look, that model will come through and it can reflect changes in the fair market value and things like that. But as far as immediately here, they're just gonna work off of that database as far as I, from what I recall, and John, jump in if it's, if you think it, if you know differently. Um, it is slightly different. We just had a situation in Wilmington last year because, you know, with the Hermitage bankruptcy, um, a number of people were appealing their valuations um, and, you know, the listers were relying on sales comps and, you know, all the sales were pre-bankruptcy um, so, you know, they, we have lost some appeals based on that. And so, I mean, Jim raises a good question about, you know, the liquidity of the real estate market right now and, and what prices would be. I would think right now, no one is buying or selling real estate. Um, and some of us are, but so, so in your scenario there, they did take into consideration the the comps and fair market value after no because there you know once you had the bankruptcy none of the properties around the hermitage club were selling so the only sure. thing they had to rely on was pre-bankruptcy sale comps which were you know which i think gave the property owners a basis for appeal and yeah. some of those appeals are still pending but some of them the the property owner has won okay Uh, any other questions or uh, issues to flag? And um, and I would also welcome you to the extent that you have questions to um, pop an email to 
uh, to legislative council, whoever you think is um, most appropriate, uh, just so that we can put those in the queue and give uh, give ledge council an opportunity to to do a little research before we get on a Zoom call with them next week. Uh, JP, go ahead. Thank you. I just had a quick question on this uh, Everbridge uh, program. Uh, everybody's talking uh, cell phones and iPads. Does this work on a computer as well? Can't say that I know. Um, that would be a question you could email um, Chief Romei and ask him if he knows whether you can get the app on a on a laptop. I know it's already been installed on your legislative iPad. Right. Okay. I'll yeah. ask. I didn't know yeah, J JP, if I'll, I may. Um, the iPads, but thank you very much. Go ahead, Jim. Um, when we did the test, uh, a few tried it on the. Uh, on a PC, and I guess it can work. Uh, I I can't sign in on the same login information with the iPad, um, and he strongly discouraged trying to do it on a PC. So uh, I would use the phone or your iPad. Um, it's it's a lot a lot easier than than trying to do it on the computer. I'm sure there's a way to do it. Um, if for some reason it won't accept the same login information. Go into the app store and type it in for a iMac, it doesn't show up at all. Okay. Hmm. JP, you got your hand up again? And JP, unmute yourself. Three times the following talk. Anyway, yes, okay, I understand that. So the other question, and this Everbridge, is this only going to be used when we go to the, um, or the anticipated to go, go to the remote voting of the entire House chamber? Um, Rob might be able to answer that question because he's been a part of the House Rules Committee meetings, but I had understood that we might use it for committee voting as well as for remote floor voting. Rob, do you have any clarity for us on that? Uh, not any more than you had said there, Madam Chair. I think that that is the intent. Okay. So at any rate, we're going to learn some new skills because, you know, it's what we it's what we have to do at this point. Um, so I would welcome you to, again, forward any questions that you have um, related to these mid-range COVID-19 um, uh, response needs to legislative council so that they can uh, be prepared to, to help us understand. And that I will make sure that when we get our committee schedule for next week that we um, get Tucker and Betsy Ann in to uh, not only talk to us about our um, our questions that, that we've raised, but also to brief us on the issues that the Senate Government Operations Committee is looking at. And so if there are no other questions, I think we will sign off for the day. Anybody else have any questions? I'm seeing no virtual hands and lots of waving goodbye. All right, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for being with us this morning and uh, have a good weekend. Try to get some exercise, stay sane, wash your hands and um, uh, be attentive to your email so that you can get our schedule for next week because it's still a little bit up in the air.